Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. More Firepower, written by British Tea Company. All things considered, the durations seem like a good buffer race at the time. With the eternal Earth Empire's advance that had gone wildly unopposed throughout the entire galaxy, it would have been finally a moment of salvation when they walked straight into the Derotian space. The Imperial Might of Earth and its immortal Emperor garnered a vicious reputation as a burning fist which crushed all opposition with little effort. In a savage strike, the humans had brought half the galaxy to its knees in less than half a decade. World after world, system after system, civilization after civilization, either surrendered to these zealous crusaders or were put to the torch. However, if there was still one last hope for the galaxy that remained, it was the Derotians. Though, by no means could the Derotians even as much as hope to withstand the full might of the Imperial military. It was the hope of those who still remained free from human subjugation that the Derotians could slow down Earth's crusade just long enough for the galaxy to muster her strength against these invaders. The Derotians, while being fairly obscure upon the galactic stage, were well known throughout the cosmos as a warrior race. While this label could literally be used on hundreds, if not thousands of other races, Derotians were the warrior race as far as the galaxy was concerned. Occupying fairly large amounts of territory, the Derotians were loosely united as a bunch of unique clans, which formed tribes, which then all banded together occasionally when the entire race needed every hand. Of course, while every virtual many nation was autonomous, previous conquerors had learned that an attack upon one Derotian was an attack upon all Derotians. Derotians stood roughly about seven feet tall and had green bodies of pure muscle. Typically, Derotian temperament usually ranged from moody to broody, or, in a few special cases, pissed the feck off. Perhaps this could be expected when life comprised of working 14 hours a day, getting into brawls with a rather vicious flora and fauna that existed on literally every Derotian planet, and then sulking in a ditch. For the layman, this meant that the Derotians were typically unhappy throughout their lives. Now, if there was one thing that could ever make Derotians happy, it was fighting. Not the type of fight where the two Derotians had to cobble over some animal because it stole the results of the afternoon's fishing, but the type of fighting where Derotians got out of their workshops, mines, and farms so that they could grab an assortment of guns and clubs to go beat on a group of people they didn't like. The type of fighting where it was a team activity that built character, and everyone could have a fun time of it. The Derotians had a culture that revolved around a warrior honor. Unfortunately, the issue with their race as a whole was that there often were no enemies to fight. When it became common knowledge that any colonies within 500 light year radius around the Derotian space would inevitably be invaded every week by a hilariously inaccurate but terrifyingly abundant gunfire and incomprehensible screaming, it was decided that colonization was simply not worth the trouble. Don't even get started on trying to fight the Derotians. That said, however, it seemed finally that the Derotians would inevitably somehow contribute to the galaxy. When the retreating armies of the Galactic Council wisely sidestepped around Derotian territory, they had shrewdly made their route appear as though they cut right through Derotian space. If they knew the humans well, well, <laughs> things were about to get a lot more interesting. So imagine the immense surprise of the galaxy that roughly two months after the first Imperial battle groups entered Derotian space, the same number of ships that walked in walked straight out. Not even signs of battle. The surprise persisted when intelligence had picked up that the humans were apparently attempting to retrofit escape pod designs into a kind of missile system. And then imagine the immense terror of the galaxy when the Imperial fleets began launching hundreds of pod-like missiles straight had enemy ships, pods that bore their way into the hulls and deposited mobs of screaming humanoids armed with a lot of guns and even more ammo. End of story.
Story number two. Humans are Gods, or War Among the Stars, written by Damage Dice DM. The Ultar were the apex predators of the galaxy. Constant conquest was their culture. A member of the Ultar society was only valuable as long as they could fight, and this brutal lineage was a crucible in which they were burned their weakness of their kind. Their methods were brutal and well known to the galaxy at large, that they would send a small ship with 100 warriors from their home planet in a random direction. The captain of the ship was implanted with a device that had no function while they lived, but upon death would activate a quantum beacon alerting the home planet of the location that they had died. They would then send hundreds of thousands of troops to that world that would dare slay Ultoth warriors. Your only hope was to surrender to the exploration party and allow them to pillage whatever they desired and embarrass you in public battle that you had no choice but to lose. Only then would they leave and move on and your world would be safe again. Earth was a new discovery to the Galactic Council. Basic diplomacy had been established and, as with all new encountered species, the humans were warned about the Ultoth and instructed on how to survive the encounter. As it happened, less than two years later, a small Ultoth vessel was detected inbound to the human's homeworld called Earth. Upon landing, the Ultoth captain made the standard demand. Humanity was to provide a regiment ten times the size of the Ultoth regiment, and battle was to be had. A location was set, and the audience to watch the events demanded. The group was entirely volunteer. No government could ask a soldier to intentionally lose and die as an alder. And die, they did, offering no real resistance as the Ultarth warriors slaughtered scores of soldiers. But then, something unplanned happened. A small child fell from the stands on the sideline, landing unconscious in the field. The soldiers moved to protect her. The Ultarth considered any human on the field a combatant and started advancing on the location of the humans. At this point, only a handful were left, and not a single Ultoth had been killed. But the tide turned quickly. Every man and woman on the field had signed up for a suicide mission, but they had not signed up to let an innocent child die. They switched to attack. Decades of training and combat experience kicked in. The Ultoth started dropping like flies in a few moments. Only the captain was left. They knew what killing him would mean so they demanded his surrender. They watched, unable to do anything, as he drew his blade and plunged it into his own heart. A black burst signaled the beacon had been set off. The humans immediately made contact with the council and pleaded that the rules did not include civilians. But it fell on deaf ears. Not only were they unwilling to help, but they admitted that they would not be able to, even if they were. Nearly two years passed, deep space probes picked up a massive fleet heading straight for Earth. They were intercepted outside the orbital path of Pluto. A battle ensued, and while the Ultoth prevailed, they took heavy losses. The Ultoth fleet redeployed, setting sights on Earth again to erase it from existence. However, they were confronted just outside the orbit of Neptune, with a fleet larger than the one they had encountered near Pluto. A second epic battle ensued, and the humans employed terrifying tactics the Ultoth had never seen, like the use of boarding torpedoes and ramming ship kamikaze style, when they had taken too much damage to continue fighting. The fight lasted days, but once again the Ultoth were victorious, but the fleet was less than a quarter of the size it was when it left the homeworld. They had never encountered such resistance in millennia. It was unfathomable that they could lose. Certainly, the humans had exhausted all they had in terms of resistance. Their home world, left unprotected, would fall. They did not even get to leave Neptune's orbit when a new human fleet intercepted them. Apparently, worried that they would run and they would not get to participate. The Ultoth fleet was destroyed. The human ships relayed this info to the fleet stationed at Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the massive fleet surrounding Earth of the victory, along with the activation of new orders to converge around Pluto to consolidate. Before 
heading to Uloth space. Around a year into the journey, they began to encounter fleets of Uloth ships, but were able to sweep them away with ease each time, leaving millions of quantum beacons screaming in the void. The Uloth knew that they were coming. The beacons acted like a trail of breadcrumbs, pointing right to the Uloth homeworld. Then suddenly, the Uloth fleet stopped coming. The last few months of the trip passed uneventfully, as the human fleet parked in orbit around the Ulas homeworld, landing craft and dropships deployed to find an entire species postulated on the ground. None dared to even raise an eye to the would-be invaders. This angered the leadership to no end, but every attempt to threaten, intimidate, or otherwise gain information from them garnered the same response. If it is the will of the humans, let it be done. The humans thought it a trick, of course. But over several days, not a single Uloth moved, unless moved by a human. They started to starve. The leadership decided to pull back off the world to assess the situation. None of them could bring themselves to kill them when they obviously were no longer a threat. But they couldn't let them return to Earth either. So a decision was made to broadcast to the planet a simple message. You are banished from our region of space, and if the Uloth ever kills a single human, we will return and end you. However, we are aware that your species are a proud warrior race, so we will inform you that no member species of the Galactic Council enjoys this protection. Do with that what you will. With that, the humans left, returning to their homes. As the last human ship left orbit, the Uloth world sprung to life. Forges lit shipyards world into action. Training commenced immediately. Their gods had given them a direction, and they would surely obey. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joachim Bakker.